synesthesia means joined or coupled sensations, so that my voice, for example, is not only something that they hear, but something that they may see or taste or feel as a physical touch. Perceiving the days of the week as colored is the most common type, and then seeing letters and numbers as colored is the next most common, and then we have colored hearing, which is the coupling of sight with sound, so that music, voice, environmental sounds, like barking dogs or slamming doors, will cause people to see what are called photisms that look a little bit like fireworks. There are lots of types of synesthesia. That by far and away, the, the best known and the most common is where when you're speaking, or, or particularly when you're reading, you see colors. There's a teacher, for example, that says, it's like a little movie screen about one foot in front of my face, and I see colored lines and waves moving. It's sort of like oscilloscope configurations. And her favorite, um, photisms are, are sounds and music that makes this, the lines go off the screen. This color phenomenon that you see when, when reading or speaking appears to be triggered by strange things in the, in, in, in the visual or the auditory environment. They're, they're, um, they're either the first letters, the sound of the first letter, or, or the, the, the shape of the first letter, or, or some, some association with the colors that are, that, are, that, are, that are perceived, which is, which is reproducible across individuals um, over time. What we've learned from the recent research is that synesthesia indeed appears in early childhood, that the associations become fixed, and once they're established, they remain constant through life. So if a particular sound is, is blue squares, it's always blue squares. The flavors that they experience are related to their childhood diet, more so than, so they're more likely to taste sweet and savory, tasty things, as opposed to, let's say, spinach uh, or liver. So um, it may be that when children are learning the names of the foods that they eat, roughly around one to one and a half years, that this kind of synesthetic association is being made to language, which they're also learning at that stage. There are a lot of people who have synesthesia. Um, and a lot of people don't know the world without synesthesia, so don't realize that there are other people who don't have synesthesia. So a lot of, you know, most people don't even talk about it that have it. And those that think about it and realize that other people don't have it think that they must be abnormal. So a lot of people avoid mentioning that they have it because no one else knows, of course. One in 90 people will have uh, colored letters and numbers, and one in 23 people will have uh, some kind of synesthesia. And if you have one kind of synesthesia, you've got a 50% chance of having a second or a third kind. So the gene for synesthesia is expressed in multiple areas of the brain. So <clears throat> the experiments that we, we designed to have a look at it, or Chris designed with his colleagues, were um, essentially to, to put in one modality and test what was happening in the other modality. So these were done through hearing, so it was speech um, color synesthesia. And um, the idea was that, that they should be lighting up their color areas as well as their, their auditory areas. And the first experiment gave the, gave the counterintuitive result. Uh, if anything, they were depressing the color areas. But what was clear was that there was a lot of stuff going on in frontal lobe areas and other areas which were much higher level. The association between synesthesia and elevated memory is quite strong. In fact, many people have what is called eidetic memory, or which is popularly known as a photographic memory, so that if they read a book, they can tell you what page it's on, where on the page it was, where the book is located on the shelf, what color the cover was, etc. The classical idea is that signals come in through the eyes, they go back to the brain, they're, they're, they're processed there in, in multiple areas in front of the in more anterior, more parts of the brain be in front of. The, the, the primary receiving area, the visual cortex. And certain areas process color, other areas process motion, other areas process the form of what is being seen. And then these are somehow um, coordinated or brought together to provide the, the unitary percept that we, that we experience. We don't experience color, form, we, we experience it all together as a unitary percept. So it seemed here as though the connections were not simple connections from the auditory area back to the color area, but were much more complex. We've known for a long time 
that synesthesia is more common in artists and creative people such as artists, um, composers, etc. And what these people all have in common is an ability to make metaphors, that is to see the similar in the dissimilar. And that's really the definition of synesthesia because if a sound is white, for example, that's an identity between two senses. A lot of people for a long time used to think that this was sort of a figment of the imagination, it couldn't exist, and blah, 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 blah. My new neighbor in North Carolina who taught at the School of the Arts invited me to dinner. And he delayed our seating with the apology that there weren't enough points on the chicken. And his friend said, oh, Michael, what are you smoking now? And I said, oh, you've got synesthesia. And he said, you mean there's a name for this? And, and that began um, a long collaboration. And he is the man who tasted shapes of that book's title. But for Michael, taste, flavor, aroma were a physical sensation. And he said, for example, um, with an intense taste, a feeling sweeps down my arm and I feel weight, shape, texture, and temperature as if I'm actually grasping something. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. And, it's, and it's, his shapes are usually geometric and symmetrical and they had wonderful textures to them. So texture, t temperature, weight, uh, s size, shape, all those uh, qualities that we normally ascribe to vision were being activated at Michael through his taste. Um, in the same way, for example, in colored hearing, um, you know, sound is activating colored shapes that, that move. And it's interesting that synesthetes say that they see odd or ugly or weird colors that they normally wouldn't pick deliberately. I mean, this is an involuntary phenomenon. And the reason for that is that the color area in their brain, called V4, is being activated by non-optical ways. So yes, they do see strange things. There's even a famous case of a colorblind synesthete who says he sees Martian colors. So his retinal pigments are abnormal, making him colorblind, but sound and touch are activating his visual cortex so he sees these weird colors. A friend brought me an Art in America uh, article decades ago about David Hockney when he was painting sets to go with operas. And this is the first time that he had ever painted something to go with music. And everybody who saw them said, wow, this is so different, so unusual. And some of the things that he said made me think that hmm, he could be synesthetic. So I wrote him a letter. And then it, three months later, I got a reply that said, Dear Dr. Saitoak, I've been carrying your letter around with me for months, wondering whether I should reply or not. And in the end, I went out to Los Angeles and spent a couple of days with him doing some studies. And indeed, sound does evoke color and shape in him. The trigger's very specific. It isn't notes, per se, musical notes, but the sequence of notes. So it's the melody that triggers something for him. So at the Metropolitan Opera, when he painted the set for Lauco Rossignol, for example, he said, on hearing it, you get this overwhelming sense of blue. So the set is entirely blue, it says, but not just any blue. And here, synesthetes are, are so particular about the exact shade or touch or taste that something is. And he said, it reminded me of that antique Victorian blue china. And so he went to the Victorian Albert and photographed 150 pieces. And, and so the, he has that china blue all throughout uh, that opera. Synesthesia arise because different sensory modalities link up in some way which then persists in an individual and persists in the individual's perceptual world and is incorporated into that individual's perceptual world so that the individual is still capable, completely capable of living a completely integrated, normal, social and individual life, but with a perceptual world that is richer or different or varies from that that everyone talks about that is considered Normal. Far from being a mere curiosity, synesthesia is a peephole onto a wide expanse of both the mind and the brain, showing us that as we learn more about it, it raises questions about how the brain is organized. I mean, basically what we thought was true for the past 40 years isn't true at all. And so it's forcing us to rethink a lot of fundamental questions about how the brain and the mind are organized.